So we're in the third week. We are in the third week of our uh, series called The Disciple Maker. Okay. And the first, the first week, uh, Pastor Ray talked about the goal of a disciple. And the second week, he said, he talked about it's time to change. Now, Jesus is still calling men and women to be disciples of his. And a disciple is just a disciplined follower of anything. John the Baptist had disciples. Um, there's, dis there's people who diligently follow other things. Those are disciples of those things. But God is calling us to be his disciples. He's calling us to be his disciples. And so maybe like a month ago, I went on a sabbatical because I was asking God, God, what, who am I? What is my purpose? What's my identity? What am I doing? Like, what, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? And so when I went on that sabbatical, I was spending time with God and everything. And I did something that I had never done before in my life. I went into an airplane and I went up to about 12,500 feet. And then I jumped out of the plane. I jumped out of the plane. I went skydiving. And I know people had been telling me, man, are you crazy? Don't do that. What if the parachute don't work? What if this don't work? What if that don't work? And I was like, well, if it happens, I'm going to heaven. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I didn't let fear stop me from doing what I wanted to do. I was like, God, you know what? I trust you. I can't be bound by what people think, what I think, what I've seen. I said, God, I'm trusting you. So we got a couple of pictures of when I went skydiving. Um, this is me in the plane after I finished repenting of all of my sins. <laughs> I was like, okay, God, just in case, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, Lord. And so we jumped out. I guarantee you guys, listen, it was the most peaceful experience I've had. Because what I learned was the higher I got, the less distractions it was. When your perspective changes, the less things become important. I couldn't hear, I couldn't hear cars and dogs barking and traffic. It was super quiet up there and I could see the curvature of the horizon. It was amazing. And then when we were just floating down, it was just peace, quiet. It was awesome. And so it made me think like, you know what? That wasn't as bad as I thought. That, was, that wasn't as bad as what people had made it seem like. I said, God, you know, I'm gonna trust you. I wanna go all in for Jesus. Like, what, what, what is my purpose? I don't wanna be afraid of what, 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 what I think or fear and all this other stuff. It was time for me to make a decision, even on that sabbatical. And then I was like, God, what is my calling? What's my purpose? What are my priorities? R raise your hand if you thought that about yourself. Like, haven't you ever asked yourself, like, what am I doing? Like, wh where am I? Who do you, who do you, who have you made me to be? And I'm sure all of us can relate to that. We, we trying to find out, look, look, why are we here? So I titled this sermon, The Priorities of a Disciple the priorities of a disciple because the world wants us to follow it. You look on social media, everybody wants you to follow them. Follow me, follow us, follow them. Everybody wants you to follow them and be on board with their agenda. But Jesus is asking us to follow him. But we have to get our priorities in order. So what is a priority? Now, priority is a thing that is regarded as more important than something else, okay? Um, raise your hand, raise your hand if you think that oxygen is a priority. Raise your hand if you think oxygen is a priority. Okay, so pretty much we need oxygen to breathe. Um, raise your hand if you think that Facebook is a priority. <laughs> Somebody say amen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's time to get our priorities in order and give every area of our lives to God because Jesus is the only way. He's the only way. 
If we already know that he is the way, the truth, and the life, he is God in the flesh. He's the word of God, the alpha and the omega. Why would we follow anything else? Now, there's a difference between just a believer and a follower. A believer is just someone who just believes in Jesus. I believe it. But then a disciple is different. A disciple is a disciplined follower. And God is calling us to follow him with everything that we have. And so now there's one thing I want you guys to know. One thing I want you guys to know, if you don't remember anything else I say here today, this one thing, and I want it to stick to your ribs, it's love God more than everything and follow Jesus first. Love God more than everything and follow Jesus first. So now we're going to see what the Bible says about following Jesus. We're going to see what God says about the priorities of a disciple. Okay? Now, everybody say, Holy Ghost time machine. Say it louder one more time. Holy Ghost time machine. Okay, boom. We're going back in time in the Holy Ghost time machine. We're going back to the book of Luke, chapter 9. Jesus is full-blown in his ministry right now. He's already been baptized by John. He's already had his 40 days in the wilderness. He's coming back with all power and authority. And he fed the 5,000. He's given his disciples uh, uh, power and authority uh, to, to cast out demons and to heal the sick. So he has a mob of people following him. And he's performing miracles. He cast the spirit, the evil spirit out of the, the young boy whose father went to him. And so he's full blown. He's going viral right now. He's trending right now. Jesus is the man. Everybody is following him. OK, so now when he's as they're following him, there's people that's coming to him and they want to follow him. Now, some of them may know the commitment, but some of them may not. So as we go into this word, I want everybody to put themselves in the scripture, put themselves in this story. So the whole point is when we're reading the word and we're studying the word, the important thing is to actually do it in your life so you can get the results. Amen. OK, so because what, what's what's the point of knowing that David killed Goliath back then if you can't kill the giant in your life today? Does that make sense? So receive the word. The word is for us right now. OK, the word of the Lord reads. Luke 9, chapter 9, verse 57 through 62. Verse 57 says, as they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, as they were walking, someone said, hey, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. Verse 58 says, but Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests. But the son of man has no place even to lay his head. So Jesus is letting him know that, listen, you want to follow me. I get it. But I'm letting you know it's going to be difficult because at that time, Jesus was completely dependent on his father for everything. He didn't even have a place to live. He was dependent on God for everything. And he was dependent on the generosity of other people. And he's letting this guy know, listen, you can follow me, but it's, it's, it's going to get hard. And that's what the Lord is telling us. Some things, it may not be the way we expect it to be. It may be tough. It may be challenging. But just know that God got your back. He's going to supply your need to be a follower if you want to follow Jesus. In verse 59, he says to another person. Now, this, the first guy came to Jesus and said, I'll follow you. The second person comes to him, and, he, and Jesus says to him, come, follow me. Jesus gave him an invitation. He said, come and follow me. The same way he did with Peter and Andrew when they were fishing. He went to them, and they were fishing, and he said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And the Bible says they dropped their nets and left and followed him. They dropped everything. He says, come, follow me. The man agreed. He said, yes, I'll follow you. But he said, Lord, 
First, let me. That's the key. He said, Lord, I'll follow you. I agree with you. But first, let me go. Let me go home and bury my father. A lot of times we want to follow Jesus, but it's not number one on our priority list. We want the benefits of it. I get it. We want the benefits of that. But sometimes we're not ready to actually go all in to Jesus. I know there was a time where I wasn't. I mean, I was like, okay, I believe God and everything, but I'm not ready to do all that yet. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll get saved and I'll, I'll kind of, you know, do all that stuff when I get older. You know, I want to have some fun right now. But you know what? Tomorrow's not promised, y'all. Tomorrow is not promised. So he says, let me first go home and bury my father. And Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Now, that doesn't mean that the guy, Jesus wants the guy to hate his father. That's not what that's saying. But what I'm saying is there are priorities. Don't let anyone or anything stand in the way of your personal relationship with Jesus Christ, even if it's your family. Even if it's your family. That, that, now, that doesn't mean that you're not supposed to love your family and care for them. That just means Jesus comes first. When you make a decision to be a follower of Jesus, to be a disciple. And then Jesus told him, your duty is to preach about the kingdom of God. So he's saying, listen, what we're doing for the kingdom is important now. He said, your dad, they're going to take care of him. Right now, your purpose, your calling is to preach the kingdom of God. Amen? So even if your family don't understand. Now, I'm, I know sometimes, you know, we got people in our families and sometimes they're worse than the enemies because they don't understand your walk. They don't understand where God has taken you. But you got to hold on to Jesus no matter what they say. You got to keep going. So even if, you're, even if you're, your mom or your dad or your husband or wife or someone, they say, man, you're spending too much time reading the word all the time and listen to all that Christian music and stuff. Why don't you stop all that? It ain't doing nothing for you. you man, you, you got to make a decision and say, you know what? I can't be concerned with that right now. I got to focus on Jesus. I got to focus on the word. God has called me to preach the kingdom of God. Now, when I say preach, I'm talking about you can do it through your words. It doesn't necessarily have to be up on a stage like this. Preaching is just proclaiming. You can proclaim the kingdom of God at your job, in your, in, in, at your, in, in your family. It's your lifestyle. People are watching you. He says, your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. Verse 61. Now, this is the third person. We got the first person, the second person. Now the third person says, and another said, yes, Lord, I will follow you. So he said, yes, I'll follow you. I'll follow you. But first, there's that but first again. But first, see a lot of times in this culture we live in, everything is me-centered. Follow me, look at me, look at the food that I'm about to eat. Look at where I went. Follow me. Look at me. Me, me, me. Everything is me-centered. But Jesus wants to redirect all of that and so we can get our priorities in order so we can love God more than everything and follow Jesus first, not second. Can I get an amen, everybody? Amen, amen, amen. amen. So, Another said, yes, Lord, I'll follow you, but first, let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God or not fit for the service of God. Now, Jesus said, if anybody puts his hand to the plow. Now, back at that time, a plow was... Uh, a, a, a garden uh, machine device, because this is back in the, what they call an agricultural society. There were no machines, so everybody kind of grew their own food and did farming. 
So a plow was something that somebody would get behind. Sometimes it would be, uh, it would be two oxen uh, or two horses pulling it, but somebody would have to stand there and walk in a straight line and it would dig up trenches in the ground so then they can go behind it and put seed. And so Jesus is using that analogy because he's talking to a bunch of farmers and he's giving, them it, giving it to them in a way that they can understand. And it says, no one who puts their hand to the plow, no one who starts to move forward and looks back. He's talking about looking back because when the person is pushing the plow, if you look back or get distracted, you might not go in a straight line or it might mess up the next lane. So the analogy is keep pushing forward. If you put your hand to the plow to make a decision to go all in for Jesus, don't look back. And what that means is don't look back in your heart. Don't look back in your heart. Now remember Lot's wife. Lot's wife was back in, they lived in, uh, in, in Sodom and then the angels came and said, come on, we gotta go, we gotta go. And the angels came and, and, and pulled them out of that city because God was gonna send fire onto that city. But God sent some angels to save them and what happened was as Lot's wife was walking away, she looked back because her heart, part of her heart was still there in Sodom and then she turned into a pillar of salt. So Jesus is saying, look, don't look back. Now that doesn't mean that you don't love, you're not supposed to love your family or care about them. That doesn't mean that. But don't let anyone or anything get in the way of your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You gotta be bold, even if your family is tripping. You gotta hold on to Jesus, y'all. Even if, I'm gonna just say this, even if your kids, even if your children, and I know mothers, fathers, you love your kids, you're supposed to, yeah. But even your children, and it sounds hardcore, but listen, don't even let them stand in the way of your personal relationship with Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. And so there's people who will love you away from your purpose. Now this happened to me. Now I had to, listen, there was a time when, right before I came to the men's home, I had never had a drug problem. Um, I didn't have an alcohol problem. Um, I had a sin problem. I had a sin problem. And it seemed like there was some stuff that was just going nuts in my life. Like I was like, I don't know what's going on. I felt like I'm losing my mind. I was having panic attacks. I mean, it was just bad because it was my own pride. It was my own sin, my own, my own flesh. I was my own God. And I had been, you know, saved, going to church, and I was still doing the Dex Davis cartoon, and I thought that I was doing everything for God. But God was like, no, there's some stuff in your heart. There's some things in your heart that I gotta show you that's in there. Because just because you don't have a drug problem or alcohol problem or a substance abuse problem, that doesn't mean that you don't have sin in your heart. A lot of times people used to, they, we, we compare and we say, well, I'm not like them. I'm not that bad. Well, I'm a good person, but listen, you have to be born again. You gotta be born again, amen. Because being a good person doesn't get you into heaven. What gives you eternal life is being washed by the blood of Jesus and putting your faith in Jesus Christ. That's what gets you eternal life. So even though I had done that, there was still deeper levels of intimacy that I didn't have with God. And he was calling me to be a follower. And I remember I was in the car one time and, and I, I was like, okay, I called my mom and she didn't know what was going on. And I called her and I said, mom, uh, I'm going down to this, this, this home in Texas for six months. And she said, what? You gonna do what? She didn't know because I didn't tell her anything. And she, and she started panicking. She was like, no, don't do this. Listen, you need to come home. You need to come home. We'll find you somewhere to go where you can get some help and just be around. Don't, don't, don't do that. So right then is where I had to choose. I had to make a choice. Am I going to go home to my comfort zone around my family who really doesn't understand what's really going on? Or am I going to choose to get the help that I need? Amen. And it was tough. And I sat in that car. I sat in that car and I was like, and at first I said, you know, okay, you're right. I'm gonna go back home 
and we'll find some place. And that felt good to my flesh, right? It felt like that was the reasonable thing to do. But then God started dealing with me. And I was like, you know what? If I go back home, I'll never get the help that I need. So I had to choose, regardless of what my mama said, I had to choose to go down to Abilene, Texas, to a place I had never been before, and stay there for six months, no phone, no internet, didn't have access to nothing. But that was the best decision I ever made in my life. That was the best six months I ever spent in my life because I learned how to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I learned how to be a follower of Jesus. I learned how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise for the word. God is good. We have to choose. We got to choose to love God. Now, it's not that my mom was purposely trying to sabotage me. No, but she loved me. She didn't understand what was going on. A lot of people in my family didn't understand. But I had to make a choice to follow Jesus all the way. And that's what God is calling us to do. We have to love God more than everything and follow Jesus first. Now, how do we do that? Like, how, how do we do it? Like, what, how do you actually love God more than everything? and follow Jesus first. Well, step number one, you gotta choose. Simple. You gotta choose to love God more than everything. Do me a favor real quick. Um, raise your right hand in the air and hold it up. Raise your right hand. Okay, now put it down. Now let me ask you a question. Did you try to raise your right hand or did you just do it? Say it, say it louder, say it again. You just did it. You didn't try to do it and then maybe didn't do it. No, you said, I'm going to raise my right hand and you raised it up. So you made a choice to raise your right hand. Now, you had a choice not to. Does that make sense? You had a choice not to raise it, but you chose to raise it. So it's just that simple. Now, there may be some other circumstances involved with that, but you make a choice to love God. The Bible says, I set before you this day life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life that you may live. We make choices all the time. You got to make up in your mind that you're going to choose Jesus over everything else if there's a conflict. Just like you choose to spend time with your family. You choose to spend time with something. If you're hungry, you make a choice to eat. Are you with me so far? So we have to choose to love God. Step number two. Now, this is a word. When I was on my sabbatical, God showed me a word. I'm talking about it's a small word in the English language, but it completely, completely changed my perspective on everything. And I'm still learning it. I'm still learning it. I'm about to put you up on game right now. Now, when I learned how to use this word, and I'm still learning it, this word gave me so much power and freedom in my life that I had really never had before. And I'm gonna tell you what that word is. Now, if you use this word at the right time, it literally has the potential to change your life. I'm not trying to sound like an infomercial, like I'm trying to sell you some cars or something. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just letting you know it has the potential to change your life. And that word is, you want to write this down? No. No. Okay, everybody say that real loud. No. 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 Say it loud. Say no. 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 <laughs> that word has power because a lot of us are so used to saying yes to everyone and everything. Because we don't we want to people please. We want we don't want to be looked at as the bad guy. So anytime people say, "Oh, let me borrow some money." Okay. And I'm not saying not to lend people money, but you know, you know when some people are trying to scheme, right? 
Or why don't you, oh, 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 why don't you come with me to do this? And you say, oh, well, okay. And you know it's a bad decision. But something in us, we, don't, we think we're selfish if we say no. Remember, your yes is expensive. When you say yes to something, when you say yes to something, it's gonna cost you energy, physical energy, it's gonna cost you, could, 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 could cost you some money, right? <laughs> it could cost you brain energy. It could cost you time. So while you're over here, something that you said yes to, that you're really not supposed to be saying yes to, you're over here getting worn out. Meanwhile, where Jesus wants you to say yes to is over here. You're missing out. Say no to the distractions. So when you want to read the word and somebody calls and said, hey, let's go out here and eat right quick. If you know you're supposed to be reading the word and spending time with Jesus, what you going to say? No. You got to say no. You got to choose. You got to choose. See, he got it back there. He had it right. No. I'm telling you that word, if you learn how to use that word at the right time, It'll give you so much freedom. Listen, and don't think that you're selfish and you're not being loyal because you say no. You, you have to protect your time, protect your priorities, right? You have to protect your priorities. Raise your hand if you've been on an airplane before. Raise your hand if you've been on an airplane. <laughs> That's good, I like that. So, on the airplane, when they give you the safety, the, the safety uh, uh, precaution stuff, right? They go over the safety rules. When they say the oxygen mask falls down, what do they say? Who do they say to put it on first? They put it on, they tell you to put it on you first. And that may sound kind of selfish, but it's true. It's like, wait a minute, if you can't breathe and you suffocating, you can't help nobody else. You put it on yourself first. So you have to protect your time, protect your priorities. And the word that you use to protect that sometimes is what? No. no. Amen. We have to love God more than everything and follow Jesus first. Now imagine if everybody in here made a commitment to follow Jesus all the way with no excuses. Imagine if we were focused, laser focused, our families would be blessed because when we say no and we focus on Jesus, right? and we get fulfilled in Jesus, we become our best selves for everybody else. So everybody gets blessed. And you're in your purpose, you're moving, you're flowing, the Holy Spirit is moving in your life. You're affecting people at work, affecting people on your, I mean, uh, in your family, affecting people in the neighborhood. How different would Abilene be? How different would the world be? How different would your life be? And all of that is possible, and it starts with you right now by making a decision and getting your priorities right to follow Jesus. So, the Bible says in Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, now this is important right here. Now, this is Jesus talking in Luke chapter 9, verse 23 to 24, and the word of the Lord reads, Then he said unto them all, If anybody desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Take up your cross daily. And that doesn't mean living a life of suffering and poverty and, and, and hurt and lack and bad health. That just means you have to be willing to be able to give everything for Jesus and follow him every day. For whosoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whosoever loves, loses his life for my sake will save it. We gotta take up our cross daily because people are watching you. They're saying, look, if you claim to be a Christian, let me see how you handle getting angry. Let me see how you handle when you're going through trouble. That's taking your cross, that's picking up your cross, being willing to yield your will for Jesus. God said, not my, Jesus said, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. It's called absolute surrender. Everybody put both hands up in the air like that. Now, you can use that for praise and worship as well, right? But another symbol of that is surrender. 
Surrender everything. Just like Jubal said earlier, give everything to God. You can put them down now. No. <laughs> You're dying to self. And so I guarantee you, listen, if you trust God and give him your life, the life that he has for all of us is so much better than the one that we thought we could have. It's so much better. Trust him. Now, this is God talking. Jeremiah 29 and 11. And the word of the Lord reads, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Now, this is God talking. He said, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, all of you. Thoughts of peace, thoughts of peace, not of evil. God is thinking these thoughts toward you. And he wants to give you a future and a hope. But the enemy, the world, the devil, whoever you want to call it, is telling you, get rid of your life right now. It'll never get better. No one loves you anyway. Those are lies. Those are lies from the pit. But God is saying, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. So trust God and give him your life. Love God more than everything and follow Jesus first. And I guarantee it'll be the most exciting ride you've ever had. God has purpose and calling for each and every one of us. So around this time, there's usually three types of people. Jesus is right here and he's calling all of us to a deeper, more intimate relationship with him. And so the first group of people are people who are not even born again. You might have heard about this Christian thing. You might have read about Jesus, but you haven't really given your life to God. And to you, I say, trust God. He created you. He made you. Give your life to Jesus. Put your trust in him. And I guarantee you, he will be there for you every step of the way. He'll supply your need. He'll show you who you are by putting your faith, simple faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Now, the second group of people are people that have been born again. You've been saved. You've been coming to church for a little bit. But you're still kind of teetering and tottering, kind of riding the fence a little bit. And to you, I say, make a decision and follow Jesus right now. Just follow him. Get involved. Make a commitment. Join a life group. Join Rise Church. Join this Rise family so we can do life together. Get into a more intimate relationship with Jesus. And the third group of people are people who've been saved for a while. You may be in ministry. You might have been uh, uh, living this Christian life and have a relationship with Jesus. But he's always calling us for a more deeper, intimate relationship with him. There's always levels of following Jesus. And it will never end because he's endless. There's always more to discover. And I say to you, follow Jesus even deeper. Spend more time in the word. Learn how to say no when you know it's going to take you away from your priorities. Amen. So I'm going to pray. And as I'm praying, just really put your heart on the line for God. He knows what you need. He knows what you want. And just give it to him. So we're going to have prayer warriors on the left and the right side of the church. Come on down if you want prayer. But um, I'm ex really excited about what God is doing. Listen, follow God first. Follow him first. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you and give you praise and glory for your word. Thank you that we're going to be doers of your word and not hearers only. Thank you for the, the, the revelation that you've given to your people watching here in person and online. And God, we thank you that everybody's going to make a decision to follow you. And I thank you, God, for moving in their lives in a mighty way. And we're excited about what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Love you. Thank you for joining us here at Rise Church Online. We hope today's message was impactful. Listen, we want to stay connected with you. So by clicking on the link below, you can find out how to do that. Also, by clicking on that giving link, you can help us continue to advance the kingdom of God through discipleship and outreach. Please subscribe to our channel for all new content. We'll see you next week. Thank you and God bless.